God, God is a good God. I'm telling you, reading in the Word today, I, I, I tell you, I just got myself so stirred up. I told this gun, I said, my God, this Word is so great, it's so good. I just can't hardly stand it. And we never really got into the Word of God. We just couldn't hardly take it anymore. But God's Word was just that good. And I, I just, I'm just astounded sometimes with people that don't get in the Word. I'm astounded with Christians that don't really get into the Word of God. But I'm telling you what, everything that you need is in the Word of God. It's right there in the Word. Worship and praise service is wonderful. But you know, a lot of the churches today, they have a, a worship and a praise service that lasts about an hour and a half, and then I have a 15-minute sermonette, and then that's it to church. But some of the churches, thank God, some of the pastors, some of the evangelists and prophets and, and uh, you know, uh, the whole five uh, four ministries are getting back to the Word of God. They're getting back, getting people back into the Word. And I'm telling you, when you get into the Word, and you take that Word, how many knows the Word is a seed? And how many knows life is in the seed? You know, they discovered not too many years ago that in a, one of the pyramids, and this pyramid is probably, I don't know how old, three, four, five thousand years old. And they found in this pyramid some seeds. And you know what? They took those seeds just to experiment with it. They put one of those seeds in some dirt. And guess what? It sprang up. Thousands of years old, but the life is in the seed. Now you think about the Word of God. Life is in the seed, and the seed is the Word. Life is in the Word. Amen. Well, I feel like I went around the church just saying that. <laughs> Amen. Life is in the seed. Oh, my Lord. So all I have to do is plant that seed. Because if I don't plant the seed... It's just dormant. Even though life is in it for those thousands of years sitting in that pyramid, life was always in that seed, but it was not planted, so it didn't manifest what the life of that seed was. But then it was planted. Amen. Oh, you can let this thing we call the Bible you can let it sit there in your living room on your coffee table. You can let it sit there in your bedroom on your nightstand. Year after year after year after year. And you wonder why nothing works. All the time, the seed was there for you to plant. Oh my Lord. Always there for you to plant. I believe that somebody's been planting some seeds in this place. Yes. Amen. Yes. For everything that I'm going to speak to you about tonight, and uh, there's only one reason that it's possible. That's because of the Lord Jesus Christ yes. and what He did at Calvary. Yes. Amen. Yes. Things I want to speak to you tonight is about the promises of God and how that they work. And why they're not working. They're not working for some people. <coughs> Can you say amen? amen? They're not working for some people. It's that seed. It's got to be sown. And it's got to be sown in good ground. Amen. amen? Yes. Someone estimated that there was 7,487 promises <coughs> in the Bible. I'm going to drink some water if you've got some. 7,487 promises in the Bible. Now that's a lot of promises. Amen. 7,487 promises in the Bible. The Bible tells us that we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. The short heir means that we are an equal heir with Christ. So whatever Christ has, 
Guess what? We have an equal share of what Christ has. Can you say amen? amen. An equal share of what Christ has. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ has all power in heaven and where else? And in the earth. If you have all power in heaven and in earth, guess what? There's no power left. That's it. He has all power in heaven and in the earth. And we are an heir, a joint heir, an equal heir with that power. Think about that now. We're an heir of God and a joint heir, an equal heir with Jesus Christ. Whatever Jesus has, we have the same. That's a promise of the Bible. That's one of those 7,487 promises. Amen? Now, the Bible says this in Psalm 103, forget not all his benefits. I mean, those who've got benefits. Amen. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thine sicknesses, diseases, illnesses. That's a promise of God. That's one, I'm not going to tell you all 7,487. I don't have time tonight. Even though I, I really had mercy on you last night. Now, but tonight I may not. Because... The longest I've ever preached is three hours. That's two 90-minute tapes. That's the longest I have ever, ever preached. Should I go for the record tonight? <laughs> well, we'll put it off. We'll put it off. But think about that. That's in the Old Testament that God asked the people, He said, I don't want you to forget my benefits. I've got benefits for you. They're better than General Motors. I got benefits for you that I will forgive you all of your iniquities and I will heal you of all your diseases. That's the word of God. Amen. Can you say amen? In Psalms 35, it tells us about how that the Lord has pleasure. How many would like the Lord to be have pleasure with you? We feel like the Lord have pleasure in you. I want the Lord to have pleasure in me. And in Psalms 35, verse 27, it speaks about how that the Lord hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. He just gets plump tickled at your prosperity. I mean, that's the word of God. So must be that is the word of God. I used to have a, a dear sister in our church. She was a real hellfire brimstone woman. Now, she was a godly woman. But every time that I would preach on hellfire and brimstone, she'd amen me. But then when I would preach on the goodness of God and the grace of God and God's benefits, she'd sit there and look at me, you know, <laughs> real strange looking. <laughs> it was like she couldn't take the whole word. She wanted just this part. How many wants the whole nine yards? <laughs> He takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. That's in the word of God, Psalm 35, 27. In 3 John 1 and 2, we know all of what that says. It says, I wish above all things that you thou mayest prosper and be in hell, even as thy soul prospers. That's some of those promises. I'm just mentioning the few here. And then Matthew chapter 10, Jesus talks about those that have left the houses and lands and sisters and brethren and wives and for his sake or for the gospel's sake that will be rewarded in this life a hundredfold houses and lands and brethren and sisters Amen. and in the life to come everlasting life that's one of those promises in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 he said to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, and they say things, that the Gentiles seek after will be given unto you. That's the words of Jesus. That's some of those promises. 
in Matthew or Mark, brother, chapter 11, you all know the, these verses where Jesus said, speak to the mountain. He said, if you will not doubt, but believe in your heart the things that you said, you will have whatsoever you said. He said, when you pray, if you will believe that you receive the things that you pray for, you will have them. That's the promises of Jesus. He said, if you pray and you believe, you're going to get it. Is that right? Yes. Have you ever prayed and didn't get it? <laughs> but he said, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you have received them, and you will have them. That's what's one of those promises. In Luke 6, 38, he said, Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, Shake it together, run it over. Shall men give unto your bosoms? In other words, he can give you favor with men. He can give you favor with the boss on the job. Yes. He can give you favor if you had to go take a test. He can give you favor with people. And he would cause people to give to you. That's the promises of Jesus. Yes. Can you say amen? Amen. And of course, we're all familiar with the promises of Deuteronomy chapter 28. If you've ever read that, there's blessings and there's cursings. But some of those blessings are, he said, now all these blessings will come on you. If you kept his commandments and all these blessings. And he began to talk about the blessings of God, how that his blessings would overtake you. He said, well, you're going to be blessed in the city. You're going to be blessed in the field. He said, you will lend and not borrow. How many would like to get to that place? How many made up your mind that you're not going to borrow no more? How many is going to get out of credit card debt? Let me stretch some hands here. Amen. Come on. You need to get out of debt, right? Amen. Because we're supposed to be lending, not borrowing. These are just some of the promises of God. And then in the book of Hebrews, the Word of God tells us that God had given us a Better covenant. That's Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 13. I'd read the whole thing if I were you. He talks about the new covenant, the new testament, the new deal. That God has given all of us a better covenant with better promises. Better promises than Deuteronomy 28? Yes. Better promises than anything if you could find in the Old Testament, the Lord has given us a better covenant with even better promises. Now that's what God's Word says. That is the seed that we find in this Word. And it should be producing that harvest in your life. Matter of fact, not too many uh, months ago, maybe a year or so ago, I wrote an article and, uh, of course, I didn't get a whole lot of good reaction from it, but I still believe it. And I wrote in that article how that Jesus promised us life and life more abundantly. Amen. And how that the greatest abundant life anyone could possibly desire is a life where that you never need healing. Amen. A life where you would never need a miracle. That would be an abundant life. If I never did need healing, I never did need a miracle, I would be walking, amen, in the seed that I find in the Word of God to the fullness of it. No miracle needed. Because, listen, you know for a fact, if you've got to have a miracle, you're going through a crisis. If you've got to have a healing, you're sick. You're got, there's something going wrong in your life. You're under attack of, the, of, of demon, demons. But what if you never needed healing and you never needed a miracle? You'd be walking like Jesus walked. I cannot believe, I cannot picture in my mind Jesus having the flu. I can't picture in my mind. I just can't do it. I cannot picture. Even though he was tempted in all points as we are tempted, he was without sin. He, he overcomes sin as a man, not as God. And I, but I cannot see him sniffling around and sneezing and asking Peter, hey, let's go down to the drugstore and get us some cold medicine. I cannot picture Jesus being with the flu. In the Bible, Jesus said, everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. He said, you can't be above your master, but you can be as your master. 
Remember that song a few years ago, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. All I have is to be like Him. I want to walk like Jesus. I want to talk like Jesus. I want to live like Jesus. I want to have the consecration and the dedication and the holiness of Jesus. And I want to walk as He walked. And I believe He walked in divine health. I do. I believe He walked in divine health. When I find over in the Old Testament, the people in the wilderness where there was not a feeble one among them and God delivered them with silver and with gold. Can you say amen? And there was not nobody sick. That's a promise of God in the old covenant. We've got a better covenant with better promises. Now you're talking about impossible faith. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Believing in the impossible. He quit listening to CNN and Fox News. Quit listening to every Tom, Dick, and Harry with a negative report and get back to the Word of God and it's filled with the promises of God of a life living in Jesus with authority and power and being an overcomer no matter what you're facing. I believe it's possible now. You may disagree with me. That's okay. I understand. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. Everybody don't like me. I don't understand why I'm a nice guy. When you get to know me. Amen. But the Word of God is just eating me alive. And I want it to. Yeah, but I want you to eat His flesh. I want you to drink His blood. I want the Word of God to dominate your life morning, noon, and night. Amen. Because if I can get you to that place, you're going to live in divine hell. You're going to live as an overcomer. You're going to live putting the devil on the run. You're going to live like the Word of God tells us that we can live. I'll just tell you what the Word says. Do you love it? So we've got a better covenant with better promises, better than anything that I mentioned in the Old Testament, better than Deuteronomy 28, better than the children of the wilderness where there was not a feeble one among them. And by the way, in Deuteronomy 28, it tells us plainly that no disease, no curse, nothing like that will come nigh your dwelling. But Jesus has given us something even better than that. Even better than that. Because they didn't have the Spirit of God living in them. See, the new covenant is Christ in you. The hope of glory. That's what the mystery of God is. That God does not live way out here somewhere beyond the universe. But He lives in His people. Christ is in me. Jesus lives and abides inside of me. He's in you. You're His temple. You're His body. And I don't believe Jesus liked being sick. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'm not getting on to y'all, man. I'm trying to teach you something about the Word. Yes. If I can get this across to you tonight, I'm telling you, it will revolutionize your walk with the Lord. Amen. Every word that was spoken last night will come to pass in your life. Yes. I told someone today, I believe it was, uh, somebody here recently, I said, years ago, I was never surprised when I laid my hands on someone and they were healed. It never surprised me. When I would pray for my children, I, their, their fevers would break under my hand and they would become cold under my hand. And I never struggled in prayer. I just believed that they believed. And I was never surprised when someone got delivered and someone was healed. When I was surprised was when they didn't get healed. But now today we're shocked when God gives a miracle. We're surprised when someone gets healed. We can't hardly believe it when someone gets a miracle and someone, you know, a, a fever breaks or they're healed of whatever problem they're going through. It's like, oh my God, that's what God did. But it should never be a surprise to us. Why? Because Christ is in us. Christ is in you. It should never be a surprise when God works a miracle on your behalf. 
I'm not saying you shouldn't praise him. I'm not saying you shouldn't thank him. But it should never surprise you. That you get what you ask for. Because when you get to the place that it doesn't surprise you, guess what? You're now entering into a realm of faith with God. That God desires us all to be. Where there's nothing impossible for a man or a woman that will believe God. But it's the seed that we have to plant. The words that I've spoken to you so far, guess what? They're all seeds. I'm sowing something in your heart. I'm sowing the seed of the word of faith in your heart. I'm sowing seeds that I find in the word of God, promises that I find there. In hope that it will find some good ground that can be cultivated and bring forth a harvest in your life. I'm sowing seeds last night, amen, to get you to see that you had power over the devil. And that you had it under your feet. Those seeds are looking for some good ground. And if those seeds can find that good ground, guess what? It will start producing a harvest in your life. It will bring forth healing in your life. It will bring forth prosperity in your life. It will bring forth a miracle that you need in your life. But first, you've got to receive the seed. And it's got to be in good ground. Somebody say good ground. Amen. You remember what Jesus talked about the sowing of the seed. Some brought 30, some 60, some 100. Amen. If you go back and read it, you'll find that it's those that, that were found in good seed that brought forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. Amen. I want to bring forth 100 fold in my life. Amen. Maturity in Christ. It's talking about the seed being the word of God. And it can break forth to some 30 fold, some 60, or some 100 fold. What's it talking about? It's talking about that seed is the life of God's word sown in a person's heart. And if that person took care of that seed, and it watered that seed, and it nourished that seed, and it worked with that seed, that what it's doing all along is bringing forth that harvest inside of you. It's bringing forth faith. It's bringing forth power. It's bringing forth an anointing. It's bringing forth healing and deliverance. That's what that seed is doing in you. And some of you come to 30 fold, some 60, but yet some will bring 100 fold, 100 percent. Jesus coming forth in your life. That's what we're talking about. But there's two ingredients that must be applied to that soul, which is your heart. It's going to take more than the seed, believe it or not. It's going to take some watering of that seed. It's going to take, hey man, coming to church and being a part of a, a word and being part of a movement, being part of worship and being part of praise. Those are all washing. They're all rains to water the seed that's in you. But there's a seed that needs to be sometimes fertilized. And we know there's some fertilization that needs to occur sometimes. And to fertilize that seed, if we fertilize the seed, if we water the seed, if we take care of the seed, it's going to bring forth a great harvest. And the harvest is going to be the fruit of God's promises in your life. Because the word is in here, I've given you the word, just a little bit of it. All of the promises of God in Him. And they want to know the promises of God is that? It's in Jesus. And all the promises of God in Jesus is what? Yes. And amen. Yes. So all the promises, all 7,487, they are all in Jesus. They're all in Him. Can you say amen? All of those promises are in Him. And in Him is yes to every one of those promises. He said yes to every promise of God. It's yes and amen. If you want it, you can have it. It's yours according to the word of God. In him is yea. And amen. That means amen and let it be so. Amen. Now that's a seed. How many can receive that seed? See, that word is a seed. 
And all the promises of God are in Christ. Guess where Christ is at? Christ is in me. Amen. So all the promises of God that are in Christ is where? They're in me. All the promises of God that's in Christ is where? They're in you. They're in you. They're in you. They're in you. All these promises is already inside of you, ready to be brought forth. Or ready to be manifested in your life. In your life. A, a very familiar, this is where you all get started out. Glenn brought this out. Submit yourself to God. That's a requirement. You'll never get a seed to produce anything in your life until you first submit yourself to God. When you submit yourself to God, then that automatically begins to, to ferment that seed. It begins to come forth. It begins to want to grow. Amen? The other scripture that's one of my favorite scriptures I, I quote quite often, probably I've quoted here maybe even a dozen times. It's found over in the book of Romans, I believe it's chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, somebody say bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Yes. So what's the Lord speaking to us? He's saying, listen, if you want this seed of the promises of God to manifest in your life, you've got to give him your body. Not just your spirit, not just your soul, but your body. He wants your body. He wants your body. And he wants your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. And the Word of God says that's just your reasonable service. That's just something reasonable. He said, I'm not asking you anything unreasonable. I'm not asking you anything that's hard. I'm just asking you for something that's very, very reasonable. I just, I want your body. <laughs> And I want your body holy. Yes, and he said, that, that, that's just something reasonable that I want. And he said, but if, and if you'll give me your body, which is just reasonable, if you just give me your body, and then begin to change the way you're thinking, you'll transform yourself. Yes. The word transform means, a, it, it, it comes from the Greek word, it's like the word metamorphosis. It's like when a, when a caterpillar changes into a butterfly. And that's what God's Word is saying will happen to you when you begin to cultivate the seed by giving Him your body. You begin to transform yourself. You begin to change into something different than where you're at now. And the Word of God is telling us this, letting us understand it is a complete change that God is going to roll inside of your life when you begin to renew your mind. Amen. Change your mind. Change the way you're thinking. Quit thinking like the church world has taught for years. Quit thinking like mom and daddy, grandma and grandpa preached 50 and 100 years ago. They didn't have the fullness of the revelation of the word that we have in this last generation. Jesus is about to come back from a church full of faith and power, anointed and ready to go be with Jesus. God opened up his word, opened up his understanding and his revelation to those that are hungry for his word. He said, you got to change the way you think. you got to renew your mind. you got to transform yourself. Don't be conformed to the world. Don't be like the world. Don't fashion yourself like the world. Fashion yourself like Jesus. And that's one of the, the things that we have to do to cultivate the seed. For if we fail to submit ourselves to God, if we fail to give God our bodies, then that word will never come to pass in your life. It can't. Somebody said it can't. It can't because you're not following the instructions that God has laid down in His Word. So we've got to renew our minds, transform ourselves, give ourselves to the Lord. Can you say amen?
And there's another very important lesson that we need to learn. To be able to make sure that we get the necessary ingredients, nutrients, whatever you want to call it, into the seed of God's Word that's in me. And I believe every time you study the Word, you read the Word, you're applying yourself to that Word, those seeds, you're multiplying, you're cultivating that seed. But one of the lessons I want you to learn is from Hebrews chapter 3, and I'm going to read a few verses here beginning in verse 5. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5. We're going to read about them back in the olden days of those in the wilderness. Those very ones that there wasn't a feeble one among them, and how God delivered them with silver and with gold. I'm going to talk to you about these people just here a moment, that every day they say in the cloud by day and the fire by night. And how did God rain down manna from heaven for them to eat? They see the miracles and the power of God. When they become upset, they begin to argue, they begin to complain and say, Can't God supply a table in the wilderness? And God almost choked them to death with meat. But listen to what the Word of God says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. That means going to hold fast. And the verse 7 says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, today if you will hear his voice. Now the Holy Ghost is speaking. Remember Hebrews is written to also us in this last generation. He said, harden not your hearts. Now and all of a sudden he's changing the tune. He said, now the Holy Ghost is speaking. Harden not your hearts is in the provocation. In the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I would grieve with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren. This is the Holy Ghost speaking to the church. He's speaking to me and you. And he said, take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, what I was called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now listen, for we are made partakers of Christ if, somebody say if, yeah. we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. And here he goes to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Listen, I've given you the voice of the Lord here for several minutes about the promises of God. I gave you the voice of the Lord last night about how that God was going to have an overcoming army and you were part of that overcoming army and that you had power over all the power of the enemy. As a matter of fact, you know, the devil wouldn't flee from you. I was giving you the word of the Lord. His voice is the voice of the word. The voice of God is the voice of the word. And he said, don't harm your hearts like they did in the wilderness, in the provocation. Verse 16, for some, when they had heard, they heard the word, did provoke. How bad? Not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Yes. Amen. They heard the word. Amen. They heard the promises of God. I'm promising you a place that's flowing with milk and honey. I've got a promised land for you. You're going to enter into a rest and all when you have time, I want you to read all of Hebrews 4 about the rest that God, that I, that I have entered into. And I hope I can get some of you guys to enter into the rest that you find in Hebrews 4. 
I rest on my own works. I'm, I'm resting in Jesus. It's not I that doeth the works, Jesus said, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Jesus was resting in the fact that the Father was doing the works in him. He was at rest, and I'm at rest tonight because I can do nothing without him, but through Christ I can do all things. But we see, the Bible said that they could not enter into God's rest because of their unbelief. They were God's chosen people. They were delivered purposely by God out of the hand of Egypt. Pharaoh represented the devil. Egypt represents bondage or sin. And God had delivered him from bondage. He had delivered him from Satan. He had delivered him from sin. And he would promise them a land flowing with milk and honey. And even though they saw his works, they saw his miracles, they saw the power of God, yet they fell because of unbelief. How can they fail in unbelief? I've got the answer. It's in the next few verses of chapter 4. Let us therefore fear, and it's a warning to me and you. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Now listen very carefully with verse 2 of chapter 4. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Man. Do you realize what that said? He said the gospel was preached to them. Man. Gospel means good news. The gospel was preached to the people in the wilderness. The good news that God had a place for you. That God had prepared a place. A place for them with milk and honey. A place of security. A place of peace and of joy and of fullness. And God had promised them all of these things. The gospel was preached to them as it is unto us. But then he says, this is the reason. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as to them, but the word, somebody say the word, preach did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So all the promises of God, they heard it. They heard the word. They heard the good news. They heard the gospel. They heard about the promises of God. But they did not mix that word with faith. These 7,487 promises of God in this book that we call the Bible is a dead letter. It is a seed. But what makes it alive is when it's planted in good soil and mixed with your faith. When it's mixed with your faith, all the promises of God that's in Christ that is in you come to the place of becoming mature and then the crop, hallelujah. I'm talking about a harvest like the world is hungering for, that men and women are hungering for, a wrath, amen, of joy, a harvest of peace, a harvest of happiness, a harvest of an abundant life, a harvest of the promises of God coming to pass in your life. If you mix it with faith, you've got to believe the word. If you can't believe the word, it's a letter to you. It will never come to pass in your life. I'm looking for believers. We've got to believe the word. That's why I tell people when I preach some of this word, I, I, I want to live in it. I want to walk in it. I want to exercise faith in it. I want to believe what I preach with everything within me. Amen. And I'm hoping and I'm praying that God's word would come alive in you. That that seed of life and that seed of joy and that seed of peace and that seed of an abundant life would come to fruitation in your life and you would be able to walk in all the promises of God and be the head and not the tail. Hallelujah. That's the word of God tells us we can be. Yes. 
but it's got to be mixed with faith. It cannot happen until you believe. Sometimes people think that, oh, God's going to do all of this. God has already done it. God's not going to do nothing else. He has already given His only Son crucified. His precious blood shed for us that we might receive the Holy Spirit that came back on the day of Pentecost and live the abundant life that He died for every one of us for. He's already done it. He said, it is finished. He did it for me. He did it for you. And now, I know it's God's will and none should perish, but all might have eternal life. Yet the Word of God lets me understand that hell is enlarged in herself. People are going to hell. People are going to a, a place that was not prepared for people to go to. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. It was never prepared for human beings. Uh, but human beings are going there simply because they cannot believe uh, the Word of God. Yeah. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. But if thou canst believe, you can have it. If thou canst not believe, you can have nothing. That's why my confidence of salvation is not in my works, but it's in the grace of God. We're saved by grace and not by works, lest any man should boast. I'm saved tonight because of my trust and my confidence in the Lamb of God and His supreme sacrifice washed in the blood of the Lamb. His Lamb, this Lamb of God, has taken away my sin. He died once and for all, for all of your sins. That's where my confidence is at when I go before the King. I'm not going to tell you what I did for Him. I'm going to fall down on my face and I'm going to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that died for me and suffered for me that I might enter into his rest and entered into his rest my brethren and my sisters is what we should all be desiring a rest in the Holy Spirit a rest in God's word that no matter what comes down the tube no matter what transpires of the world my trust and my rest is in the God of glory that's going to protect me and keep me because he has promised that although a thousand was called by my one side ten thousand listen to me children he promised us that he would keep us he promised us he told us amen not to fear what was coming upon this earth he said even though the mountains be removed and cast into the sea and the earth will be shaken and not let it be moved by you don't be moved by these things that are happening let your rest be in the promises of god these seven thousand four hundred eighty seven promises of god they're all inside of you and they're going to work when you apply the word when you keep that word fertilized you keep that word amen you got to keep dying out daily how many dying daily the Bible says to take up the cross daily. He didn't say it once in a while, but he said take up the cross daily. Hallelujah. Offer up your body a living sacrifice every morning when you get up. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And when you're walking in the Spirit, the promise of God are going to start being manifested in your life. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm telling you, the Bible says, clearly praise the Lord. And I quote it while ago. I've got the scripture right here. Amen. It says this. It's in 2 Corinthians 1 and 20, all the promises of God in Him is yea and amen to the glory of God. Let me tell you some children of God, all those promises that we read about, all those promises you read about, Jesus is saying yes to you, yes to you. You can have it, you can have it. It's my promise to you. God is not a God. He does not lie. He's not like a man nor the son of man. God cannot lie. It is impossible for God to lie. And when He said these promises are Yes! He meant it! He meant it! He meant that you could walk in the fullness of life. He meant that you could walk in the fullness of God. You could walk in the fullness of the promises of God. You don't have to be sick. You don't have to be discouraged. You don't have to be oppressed. You don't have to be depressed. You can be the head and not the tail. You don't have to be poor. You don't have to be without. My God, if you break yourself up and stop.
stir you up to heaven and realize, amen, that you're a child of the king. I said, you're a child of the king. I said, you're a child of the king. You're the son of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked nation. You're the light of the world. Can you say amen? Not by anything other than you're just giving Jesus your life. All these promises of God are yours for the having. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? They're yours for the having. Amen. Sorry. They're yours for the having. Amen. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power yes. and love yes. and a sound mind. Yes. That's the spirit that I received when I was born again. A spirit of power and love and a sound mind. And every promise of God came into my life through the seed of the Word of God. I may not have realized as a young Christian, but as I began to seek the Word and seek the Lord, study the Word, I began to realize early on when I sold my possessions and I lived in an old school bus. Can you say amen? Amen. I was a Jesus hippie. Hallelujah. Amen. I chose amen. Amen. I left my job. I was a marketing director. Amen. For a firm in Atlanta, Georgia. And I sold out. Amen. I left my job as a junior vice president and I sold everything. Thing I had. I bought me an old school bus and I lived in an old school bus and then later I lived in an old shack. Amen. I pulled my old school bus up to an old shack out of the country and I lived there. I can't remember now how many years, but about three years. All I did was seek God and pray and fast and get into His Word. And I'm telling you the words that I'm speaking to you tonight are words that He put in my spirit. He put inside of me. He put the revelation of Jesus Christ, the Son God in me and that was beginning to be manifested and I want Jesus to be manifested in your life. I want the fullness of God to be revealed in your life. It is possible if you will sell out to Jesus over up your body, give him your mind, your body, your soul, your possession, whatever it takes, give it to Jesus. Amen. You will never regret it. You will never regret it. I'm talking about what it's going to take. Yes. You say, brother, that sounds awful hard to me. Oh, you don't realize. <laughs> None of that was hard. Oh, it was a joy. It was a joy selling out. It was a joy riding out of that old school bus and being laughed at. Oh, it was a joy. Amen. It was a joy in that old run down old house. Didn't have no bathroom in, no toilet in it. Oh, it was a joy. Why was it joy, Brother Hayes? Because the presence of the living God was with me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's where the joy was at. It's not in your possessions. It's not in the new automobile. It's not a new house. It's not in material things. But it's in Jesus. It's in the Holy Ghost. It's in the power of God. It's in the Word. My God, let the Word get into your heart. Receive the Word. So you're a lunatic. No, you're the lunatic. I find people in the world are the lunatics. They're like animals. They work all day. Some of them. Then they eat. Then they sleep. They watch a ball game and holler. Act a fool. Make sure that you're not a companion of fools. Because the world is a bunch of fools. Laughing and enjoying the things of this life. Never thinking about eternity. Never thinking about the afterlife. Never thinking about God. Giving themselves wholly over to eating and drinking and making merriment. Their whole lives is like an animal. All their whole sacrifices is nothing, amen. They sacrifice for nothing. They feed themselves. They clothe themselves. But yet every day they're growing closer and closer and closer to eternity. And on the other side of eternity is nothing but hell fire and brimstone and damnation. I'm telling you the fools is not of those that's in the church that's born 
word of the living God. The fools are those that's in the world that's on the way to hell. I want to wake them up and let them see, amen, there is a life, there is a joy beyond materialism and prosperity and money and things and pleasure. There's a joy unspeakable. I said there's a joy unspeakable. If you haven't found that joy, I invite you tonight to find that joy, hallelujah, that comes from knowing Jesus Amen. and being born again. Praise the, Lord. the word is a seed. Somebody say a seed. If you never take it up, if you just come to church and hear it spoken before you get to the car, you couldn't tell nobody what was said and nothing. You don't have the word in you. You don't have the word in you. Are you listening? If you let it sit on your coffee table all week and you never pick it up and discover, I said discover what's in these pages. There's something in these pages. There's a treasure in these pages. Few people will ever find. But if you want to be wise, I hope you've chosen to be wise. Amen. Open up these four pages. Just written some of them thousands of years ago. The earliest ones, almost 2,000 years ago. The later ones, probably close to 6,000 years. But it's alive. Somebody say it's alive. It's alive. And that letter, that letter, that seed is looking for some place that it could be sown. It's looking for good ground, good heart that it can sow itself into. Children of God, you'll never regret it. Amen. You'll never regret giving your whole everything you've got to the Lord. Amen. You'll never regret it. Amen. Amen. The real joy, the real joy, the real peace is not in the security of having money in the bank. It's not in the security of laying up a big bank account somewhere that, well, if I live another 20 years, I got enough money to make it. That's not where your real peace is at. If it was, I wouldn't have no peace at all. <laughs> My peace is knowing that all these promises of God is right with me. And that it is not only His will for me to prosper and be in hell. Even as my soul prospers. He counts in a joy, a pleasure to prosper his servant. See, my prosperity is, comes from God. God knows my needs and he takes care of those needs. I have very few wants, almost none. Because all my wants is wrapped up in the Word. But God takes care of my needs, not just because I'm a preacher. He took care of my needs for us in the old school bus. He took care of my needs for us when I lived in the old shack. And he did much more than that. He gave a revelation of a word and a peace and that joy unspeakable that has lasted me all of these years. I want to tell you something, folks. If you will apply this word, last night not just in, as a message but as a word from God to you today if you will hear his voice harden not your heart as he did in the provocation don't harden your heart to the promises of God God wants you happy let me believe God wants you happy he wants do you want your children happy? Do you want your children to have whatever they need in this life? Do you want your children to be sick? Do you want your children to be discouraged? Do you want your children not to have anything in this life? Or do you want your children to be happy and prosperous? But if you've been able to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give good things to them than that? 
So you, you, you can't out-love Jesus. <laughs> you can't out-love Jesus no matter how good you are to your children. Amen. It is no doubt in my mind that Brother and Sister Blair and their little grandchildren are having to raise would do anything in this world for those two children. They'd do anything. Anything to help them and to bless them. And you would too. But God's love them more than that. And the sad thing before I close, a lot of folks don't, will not let God be good to them. Some people will not let God be good to them. God wants to be good to you, my children. He wants to be good to you. Take the seeds of God's promises. Take the warnings and the reasons why this doesn't work. And correct it. Offer up your body. Change the way you're thinking. Renew your mind to the Word of God. Don't be conformed to this world. Mix the Word that's being given with faith. That means just to believe what's being spoken. Even though you might not see it materialized tonight, you might not see it materialized tomorrow, but if you hold on faith, you will see the benefits that God's Word has spoken. It will come to pass in your life. Yes. Yes. You will be blessed materially, spiritually, physically, emotionally, in every way. You will be blessed if you will take the words. Yes. Mix it with faith. Don't harm your heart to it. You will bring forth that harvest in your life. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Walking without needing a miracle. Think about it. Living without needing healing. Think about it. You ever thought about it? Living with never needing someone to pray for you. You being the prayer warrior, praying for them instead of, are you listening? Amen. I'm not getting on to you. I'm just telling you what I'm telling you is possible. Amen. Have faith in God. Amen. I can do all things to Christ, but I can do nothing without Him. But everything, every good thing is in me. Can I read that one scripture? It's one of my favorite. I, I have it right here before I close. I said I was going to close a moment ago. But we haven't had any hard preach an hour, have we? Maybe a little bit. Not hardly. I've got two more hours to go. If I'm going to break my record. I know some of you would really like for me to break my record of three hours preach here. I know you would. I really know you would. You love the Lord. Yes. Well, I, I thought I had that scripture here. I'm not sure. I got so many scriptures running out of my little old peanut brain. Sometimes I'm telling you, it is really something. Amen. And we love Jesus. Come on, you love Him with all your heart. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Well, I'm going to be able to find that scripture. I I guess I could read you about these other dozen or two here, but there's one scripture that I really want you to get tonight. Let me see, this is it. It's found in Philemon. That's in the New Testament. Philemon. Chapter 1, verse 6. And I promise you this is my last scripture. Philemon. Chapter 1 and verse 6. The thing I'm going to is hardly ever quoted, hardly ever mentioned. Philemon 1 and 6. That the communication of thy faith, remember, you got to mix it with faith. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual. In other words, that your faith would work. And you want your faith to work. Faith in there, you want faith in this work to work, don't you? It says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual, that your faith might work. By the acknowledging 
The word acknowledging means the recognition or to know. By the acknowledging of something. By the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. I said exactly what was said just a while ago about how that all the promises of God is in Him. And they are yea and amen. But now this says it a little differently. It says that your faith may become effective, that it might work. How will your faith work? When you accept, when you acknowledge, when you recognize, when you really know that every good thing is already in you. That's when it works. See what I'm saying? That's what the word said. That when you accept it, that what I've said to you tonight, when you acknowledge it, that every good thing, that's every promises of God, that's every good thing, is in you. If it's already in you, when you acknowledge that, when you accept that, that's where your faith works. Because it's not a God that's so far off. It's God not hard to hear, and He's not way over yonder somewhere. He's right here. And that's how your faith will work. If you will acknowledge that everything you need has already been given unto you if you're born again. And if you're born again, I'm assuming you're born again. And if you're not, that's a good night to get born again. And if you get born again, all of this will come to pass in your life if you'll keep that seed sown in your life. Amen. All right. Give Jesus a hand of praise. Amen. Well, if you didn't.